Matt Widgery from mattwidgery.com. Thanks very much for joining me. So in today's episode, we're going to be continuing with this adventure that I've got going from DSLRs, in my case it was Nikon, over to mirrorless and uh, some of the ups and downs and pitfalls and dramas and excitements that go along with changing fundamentally the type of camera that one uses in order to take pictures professionally. And don't worry, for those of you that are watching as amateurs, I would think that it's just as important for you guys to have a look and um, you know take stuff from this as well because yeah, like it or not, mirrorless are here to stay. They're not going anywhere. And if you're just on the verge of buying a new camera and you're thinking about maybe buying one of the uh, one of the DSLRs that are out there, as good as they are, uh, now more than ever has been the time to look at some of the mirrorless cameras as an alternative and make your own mind up either way. Uh, so when I got this Fuji X Pro One, uh, bear in mind it's only a couple of weeks ago now. Um, I'm really very new to this. I am a uh, a mirrorless newbie very much. So, um, but I got with it two lenses. Um, one of them is the uh, fantastic little 18mm f2, uh, which is this one here. Very, very compact little lens, uh, very lightweight um, and thoroughly awesome in all ways. I got this, um, those of you that follow the channel will know, I have just got rid of my Ricoh GR and this is the camera that um, I got to replace that initially before I started you know, worrying about whether or not it could do the job of the Nikons as well. Uh, but that had a fixed 18mm lens, this has got interchangeable, but that lens was for that. Um, and then I also got with it the 35mm f1.4 as well. Now those lenses are absolutely great. They're really, really sharp. The autofocus, despite what people said about them in the early days, I say I didn't have them when they first came out in 2012, but certainly by all the firmware updates that have come out by 2014, as I record this now, Oh my God, they're good. I mean, wow, you know, they really, really are good enough to do everything you'd want them to do. And, uh, you know, I think really a lot of the argument about autofocus with these cameras has really been put to bed. To give you an idea, um, I was shooting, uh, you know, sports cars with these um, on uh, yesterday, in fact, it was at the uh, the Cop Hill uh, climb and I was shooting uh, all sorts of stuff that went by, kind of vintage and classic sports cars as they raced up this hill. The autofocus locks onto pretty much everything. The only things that it did struggle with, and uh, I don't know whether or not a, a 1DX or a D4S would have been able to do this either, but um, they had the McLaren P1 go up the hill as well at the end of the day. Um, that is a car capable of 217 miles an hour and the window that I got to shoot it was very, very quick indeed and um, I uh, well, frankly, I didn't try autofocus on that. I pre-set my focus to the middle of the road, stuck it at f16, and then uh, with a high ISO that this is capable of and high shutter speed, uh, I got it, you know, just absolutely fine. But I didn't try the autofocus on that. Uh, but anyway, so is it possible to use these for fast-moving stuff? Yes, it is. Um, but that's not the point of this video. Um, this video is looking at legacy lenses and other lenses that you can use to um, increase the usability of these systems. As I record this at the moment, there is also a 60mm macro lens that uh, Fuji make. Um, there is, uh, there's a couple of zooms already out. There's an 18 to 55, and there's also a 55 to 200. And they're just about to release the, uh, the 70 to 200 equivalent lens, which is, I think it's a 40 to 100. And, 50 something like that uh, but the point about that is it's a fixed f 2.8 aperture and so it's going to be a, a, a professional grade uh, zoom lens that doesn't get darker as you zoom into the tele end which will be brilliant but uh, that lens is going to retail in the UK for about 1600 quid I'm not personally ready to make that kind of an investment into a zoom lens and anyway I wanted to see if there was some smaller, lighter alternatives that I could use when I was carrying these things around, because I like the freedom that this gives me of not having to carry a big bag of clobber. Uh, so what I've been looking at doing is trying some old legacy lenses that I've had kicking around from the film cameras that I've had, just to see what else can be uh, can be got for the money, uh, or got for the, um, for the use. And well, the money is lots cheaper as well, as you may imagine. So the first thing I invested in was this little thing here. Not the lens, we'll come on to that in a second. But the thing that it's screwed to, this is an adapter. And on uh, the back side there, that is the Fuji X mount, which clips directly onto the camera. And on the front there, that's an M42 mount, which means that any M42 lens will just screw onto there 
uh, and um, and fit your Fuji cameras. Um, and these are available for Micro Four Thirds, and you can get other things other than M42s. You can get a Lycra to Micro Four Thirds, or you can get a, a Canon to Fuji, or a uh, whatever Nikon to Sony. They're all made to be inter interchangeable. Um, they vary in price a ton, and some of them are very very expensive indeed. Uh, this was a cheap one. This cost thirteen quid, and really, unless they're going to do something else, I would not really recommend that you spend more money than this. This is incredibly nicely machined. Uh, it has uh, at the internal bit, which is threaded, there's little screws on here, which means you can adjust the position of them. Because what happens is when you screw in your lens, depending on where the threads are uh, and where you, you know, how each individual camera is mounted, I guess, um, on the other end with the X mount and what have you, um, you might not get the, the information you need coming up at the top. It might be on the squiff, and in fact it is. When I link this into uh, this camera, all my uh, sort of aperture information is kind of on the side. Um, so what I need to at some point, get a little screwdriver there, and you can rotate that inside bit around so that all that stuff goes back onto the top. Um, so that's very easy to do, and uh, that's really, really good. I will, however, be looking at the Metabone speed adapter. Uh, um, that is uh, out. It's much more expensive. This was 13 quid. The uh, the, the, the speed thingy is, um, is about 400, I think, something like that. But that does some really cool stuff. That will actually retain, because this is a crop sensor, this is a, an APS-C sensor body, um, by some magic stuff that it does in there. And it isn't just an adapter, like a spacer like these. It's got glass in it. And uh, so it, it, it gives you, it's, it's a wide angle converter effectively, so that um, you get back the original. So if you put a 70 to 200 on it, it it retains a 70 to 200 field of view, even if it's on a, on a crop body like the, uh, like the X-Pro ones. The other amazing thing it does is allows more light to get into the camera. Now that is incredible. What's happening with um, with the mirrorless lenses, uh, mirrorless cameras, part of the reason why cameras like the X-Pro1 are so, so good is because the flange distance, i.e. the distance between that rear element of the glass and the actual sensor is so much smaller than it is on a DSLR because you don't have to have a space for a mirror coming up. And that means that the light has to travel less distance. It means it's brighter and you get more light on the image. However, when you uh, put the spacers back in like this, uh, it puts it back to the same flange distance as it was on the, uh, on the original camera. So you lose all that stuff. Um, so uh, if you buy some you know, magical lens thingy that they have in there, use the Metabones one, um, if you get a, an extra, I think it's a stop that you get. So um, you know, if you put a, an F2 lens, onto it, you get f1.4, which is amazing. Um, and I really will be looking at that, but that's down the line. Uh, so what about the experiences of using manual focus, old school lenses on a modern digital camera like this? So to start with, um, I have to say, I had an adapter to take these uh, manual M42 lenses that I've got, and I've been using them on the Nikons for some time. Um, as an experience, it is one of the most singularly difficult and horrible things that I've ever done. The reason is this. When these lenses were uh, designed, and they were designed for cameras uh, like this, this is an old film uh, camera, it's a, it's a Pentax S1, um, and if you look through the viewfinder, take the lens cap off, and if you look through the viewfinder, um, you'll see in there, and you won't be able to see, but believe me there is, there's, a, there's what's called a split screen, and that allows you to focus. What happens is you're looking at sort of two elements of the image inside the, the focusing screen, and as you zoom, they kind of match up, and when they're matched up, it's a, it's a really accurate visual reference that you've got your focusing on. Um, because there was no autofocus on these cameras, you needed that. With modern SLRs, uh, modern DSLRs, which are all autofocus based, there isn't any internal help with your focusing screen. So you just, you're using your eyes and that's all you've got to kind of gauge if something is in focus or not. Now, you know, sometimes you can flip it into a live view and zoom in and kind of get more accurate focusing. And if you're doing something like product photography, landscape um, photography, or even a portrait shoot where somebody's kind of sitting fairly still, you're probably all right with that. Uh, but if you're shooting other types of things which are moving around, it's really very difficult to do. And if you're trying to take pictures on the fly just of your kids running around or of, you know, uh, an event somewhere, it, it, it's hit and miss. It really, really is. Um, so with the Fuji X-Pro1, uh, and it, they didn't have it when it came out, but what they've now got in there uh, is one of the firmware updates. One of the reasons I love Fuji so much is because they're really 
uh, seem to be committed to updating the, their camera stock and making them more modern as time goes on, adding more features after the event. And one of the things they do this, which is brilliant, is they've added focus peaking. So that means that when you're looking at something through the um, through the, the digital viewfinder, the, the electronic viewfinder, um, as the field of, of view moves in and out, whatever edge is in focus, you get like this white line around it, and it's this quick visual reminder, just like in the old days, that your manual lens is actually focused on the thing that you want it to be. So you would zoom it in, and when the, the sort of you know corner of someone's eye is, is has this white line around it, you know that you're good to focus. Yeah, you know, your focus is good. Um, so that should, in theory, be brilliant to mean that you never miss a shot. In practice, I've actually found that, particularly when I was shooting the cars the other day, where you've got surfaces that are quite shiny, and so the edges of them tend to be white because they're metal, metallic and, and, and reflective anyway, it's really nearly impossible to see where the edges uh, of, of that kind of focus peaking highlight are blinking. Uh, and so I wasn't able to really tell, um, you know, sort of what, uh, what was in focus and what wasn't. Uh, conversely, the Sony, and uh, we will be doing a review very soon of the Sony RX100, and it's on the, all of the a lot of the Sony range. The, um, the the A7 series have a similar sort of peaking system in there, um, and they actually allow you to change the color. There's like a red one and a yellow one and a white one and so forth, so that you can have something that really stands out against what you're taking a lot lot better. I haven't really had a play with those, but I will do, and I'll let you know how I get on. Um, so that's the first thing I would say that you know the manual focusing ability. Um, within these things it's, it's better than not having any focus peaking at all but bearing in mind that it does have limitations and depending on what you're trying to photograph and where and under what conditions you may find that it's easier or more difficult you know your mileage may vary uh, so that's the first thing to note the second thing to note is that, as you may imagine, not all lenses were created equally. Now I've got a bunch of stuff ranging from the very cool to the pretty iffy. Uh, this lens, for example. Now this was a, a, you know, I knew it wasn't a particularly great lens, and I'm, I'm, in, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, surprised, frankly, that the results were pretty dreadful under most conditions. Um, but what I liked about it, this is an 80 to 200, um, but it's from I guess the late 70s early 80s something like that it's a 4.5 to 5.6 variable aperture 80 to 200 zoom um, it's made by Practica it's a Practica Pentacon MC um, it does suffer from from zoom creep as you can see if you if you try to look at the stars it'll zoom out if you try and look at the earth it'll zoom in so it's going to hold it where it is um, and frankly, the results are a bit hit and miss with it. Um, there's a lot of chromatic aberration. Even when you do have the thing in focus, uh, it's not terribly sharp. There are problems with it, basically, as a lens. You can use it as a sort of art lens, for sure. And if you just want to document the moment, then that's great. But if you want to use it commercially, I would say it's absolutely no good at all. But it is bloody tiny. I mean, look at it. That's an 80 to 200. That's an 80 to 200. What can I show you to sort of... Um give you that as, an, as a, a comparison, right? That's a, that's a phone, okay? That's the Galaxy Note 2, admittedly it's a big phone, but bloody hell, right? That's a telephone, that's an 80 to 200 lens. It's smaller, it's, it's smaller than a telephone, it's amazing. So um, that has a lot of um, potential use, although the reality is it's not very good. Um, so bear in mind that not all the lenses that you get will be the same quality and there are some which are very good and some which are not so good. Um, I am certainly considering investing in some more vintage glass just to play with it and some, uh, and, and I'm going to do, I mean I got this, when I bought my Spotmatic F it came with a bunch of lenses and this was one of the ones that was in the box and um, you know I paid, well I was, I was paying for the camera really and I got a bunch of these things free uh, so I wasn't bothered about it frankly um, but yeah there we go that's that one. On the flip side and um, you know this is an awesome lens for doing portraits and stuff like that this is the uh, this is the Carl Zeiss uh, Biotar 58-2 now this lens wow I mean this is a really really nice lens um, you know this is a, a, a very highly regarded lens and for good reasons go and look it up if you're um, not familiar with this uh, it, it is a, a very historically important lens in many respects um, it's super lightweight um, and uh, and super sharp edge to edge um, it does pretty much double in size by the time you put the, uh, the the adapter on and because the adapter you know is a very different shape it doesn't really blend into it and it kind of looks a little uh, a little weird um, when it's mounted onto the camera Let's see if I can actually just put this on here so you can have a look and take the uh, the 18 2 off and and put that on. So yeah, you know, okay, it doesn't. It's not the prettiest thing in the world, but 
by golly, is it sharp. So, you know, if you're, again, if you're all right with the manual focusing and uh, you're in a situation where you can clearly see the, uh, the little sort of, um, you know, highlighted edges that you're focusing on, this lens is very, very sharp indeed and will give you a really, really cool look. Um, the other um, lens that's about the same as this is my uh, Super Takamar lens. It's, a, it's an SMC Takamar actually, which is a, a 5518. Um, so really similar field of view for this, um, and just, but just gives a slightly different kind of look. I mean, the nice thing about these vintage, vintage lenses is they all have their own kind of look and characteristic to them, uh, which is awesome. So um, that is my video on uh, on using manual lenses. Um, I will be using some more of these, and um, you know, buying some more of these, and then throwing up more individual kind of reviews on these lenses, so that you can kind of have a look at them and decide whether or not it's something that you want to have a go with yourself. Um, in terms of the uh, you know the zoom stuff, you know, of, of this period in history, the zooms, the technology has changed so much recently. Um, really, in the last five. To 10 years with zoom lenses so that you get something which is now uh, you know almost as good in the middle of the zoom range in in, in the high-end zooms as um, you know as, as their equivalent primes um, you know the gap has, has, has really narrowed in these days you know really the prime lenses would go for, were much much better than their zoom equivalents particularly at this you know this was a this was always a consumer lens this was never in, you know designed for sort of pro use um, that being said you know it has got a certain kind of vintage look to it um, which gives the, the pictures a certain characteristic and, and, and they do look like those old kind of holiday snaps from the 1970s that maybe you've seen your parents, uh, you know, you, maybe you've got, you know, old slides and that from back in the day, which have taken on lenses really similar to this. And, and if you want that kind of retro look, um, which frankly a lot of people do these days um, and, and not wrong with that, um, you know, pick up some of these cheap lenses and maybe go for the cheap ones, which are a bit kind of skanky in terms of quality because, uh, you know, you will get some interesting looks and, and the likelihood is that, you know, that they'll be different from kind of lens to lens. So you can really play around with them. Uh, a lens like that on eBay will cost you no more than 20 quid. So you're not losing a lot if you absolutely hate it and you can probably sell it for what you paid for it. Uh, so that's it. Um, if you have experienced using manual lenses with, um, with mirrorless cameras, um, you know, particularly with the, the Fuji X series cameras, because um, you know, I'm really interested to see what I can explore. Um, let me know which ones you would recommend for me to try. And um, if at all possible, I will get them and then I will throw them up and put some reviews and sample images up so that other people can see them. Uh, so leave your comments in the boxes below uh, and um, I'll be really interested to read those. And as always, subscribe using the button that's on screen now. Uh, so click, click, click on the big red box. Brilliant. Thank you very much for doing that. Thanks very much for watching and I'll see you again soon. Cheers.